In this video, we will describe the ROC and PR area under the curve metrics and gain some intuition for these by working through a couple of examples. Area under the curve metrics provide us with an effective means by which we can evaluate the performance of a classification model. Let's start by talking about the ROC and PR curves and why we might want to compute their areas. Next, let's jump into a Jupyter notebook and work through an example of the ROC area under the curve. We will then follow up with the PR area under the curve and then look at how these two approaches compare. All coding shown here is done in a Jupyter notebook available on my GitHub. You can find a link to this notebook in the description below. So you might be wondering why compute the area under the curve? Well, we have a number of different approaches for evaluating a classification model. Now, some common approaches include calculating its accuracy, its precision, recall, or F1 score. So these are all fairly effective means of quantifying how well our model is doing. However, they all suffer from one limitation, which is that they depend on having a set cutoff threshold value within our classifier. So what exactly is this cutoff threshold? Well, this requires us to understand a little bit for how classification models work. Internally, a classification model does not return the uh, discrete class labels that are within our data set. Instead, what the classification model spits out are probabilities for each class label. Now, in order to convert these probabilities into discrete values, we set a cutoff threshold value. So any probability that is above this threshold is assigned a one or it's given a, a, a positive label in the case of a binary classification data set. And anything below the threshold is given a zero. So knowing this, the advantage of using a, an area under the curve or AUC metric is that it provides us a way of computing the performance of our classifier that is independent of this threshold choice. So this is, this is quite good because effectively it means that we are dependent on one less hyperparameter, which the threshold choice is. And so now let's jump into a Jupyter notebook and take a look at the ROC or receiver operating characteristic profile. So now we're in a Jupyter notebook and we'll start with looking at the ROC curve. So first let's understand a little bit for what the ROC curve is. So this is, again, it's the receiver operating characteristic and it's defined by two terms, the true positive rate and the false positive rate. I have the equations for them written down here in the notebook. So the true positive rate is just measuring the fraction of true positives divided by the total number of positives in our data set. So that's represented by the true positives plus the false negatives. So that, that, that's the total number of true positives that we have. And then the false positive rate is the fraction of false positives divided by the false positives plus the true negatives. So if we now go ahead and we can run the following cells to generate a data set and then a plot of the ROC curve. So we're just gonna make a very simple data set using the scikit-learn make classification function the data set we are going to make consists of 1,000 samples with eight features, and it's going to be a binary classification problem, so we only have two classes. 
and a slight imbalance to the classes. So it's going to be 60% in our negative class and then 40% in our positive. And I'm setting the random state as well so we have reproducible results. So we can do a train test split where 15% of the data will go in for testing. And then I'm going to use an XGBoost classifier to try and model these data. So let, now we have our model, trained it on the training set. And now we can generate an ROC plot just by getting the output probabilities. And we can do that by calling the predict proba function on our trained model. And then we can use the ROC curve function that's available from scikit-learn in order to get the data that we need. So that, that just gives us the false positive rate and the true positive rate. And now we can generate our curve. So in this plot, we can see that the vertical axis represents the true positive rate, the horizontal axis is the false positive rate, and the performance of our model is indicated by this blue curve. And basically, the more area that this blue curve occupies, the better performing our model is. So an ideal model would simply shoot up and hit one, or, or yeah, the true positive rate would just hit one uh, immediately, right away at a false positive rate of zero. And then it would just move over horizontally. We can see that's not the case, and for real classifiers, that never really happens. Um, but we can compare this result with the baseline, and the expected baseline in this case is this dashed orange diagonal line. And so that's, that would be the expected result from just random guessing. So you might ask how this plot is actually formed, and it's essentially formed each point on this graph is formed by changing the cutoff threshold value for our output probabilities. So that's what we discussed previously a few minutes ago. So what's happening internally is that as we change our threshold, different data points appear on this plot. So you can get a sense for how the model is performing at any given threshold. Um, but also if we compare, if we just compute the area, then we get a metric that is then independent of any given uh, choice of threshold. So that's, that's the real power of doing an AUC calculation. So now we can just simply do that by calling this function from scikit-learn, and we get a result of 0.96, which is pretty good, and it shows that our classifier is able to function really well on these data, and that shouldn't be too surprising. However, now let's make things a little bit more interesting. We mentioned before that the class imbalance uh, wasn't too severe. So we had 60% in the, for the, the negative uh, class or zero class, and then we had 40% for the positive class. So what happens now if we really um, make these data highly imbalanced? How is the ROC curve going to change. So now what I'm going to do is make a new data set but really alter these weights. And in fact, what we're going to do is assign 99% uh, of the data to our negative class. So those are going to all be labeled as zero. And then only 1% of our data will consist of positive labels. Everything else remains the same as before. So we can get these data, like before, do a train test split, fit our model, and then compute our ROC curve. Okay, so here we have the ROC curve, and it doesn't look as good as before, but at the same time, it's not that bad. It's not that terrible. 
if we compute the area under the blue line, we get a result of 0.86. Okay, that's worse than before and we'd expect that, but that's not that bad. However, let's think about this for one second. And more specifically, I'm gonna scroll back up and we're gonna look at this equation here, the false positive rate. So what do we expect for the false positive rate in a case where we have a highly imbalanced data set? Where here, the number of true negatives is always going to be extremely large. Remember, the, the true negatives represent about 99% of the data that we have. So because of this, this term in the denominator is always going to be very large, regardless of what happens with the numerator um, or, or the, uh, the other term in the denominator. And this means that the false positive rate is always going to be small. Now, normally, the false po a false positive rate being small is is a good thing. That you know we we like that. However, in this case, it's misleading because of the the heavy skew in terms of how our our class labels are distributed. The false positive rate really isn't telling us much because it's going to be small no matter what. So in this case, can we really believe this result that we have, 0.86? And the answer is, is not really. So what we need to do in this case is replace the false positive rate with something else, with something that's better suited for dealing with highly imbalanced data. And now this is where the PR AUC comes into play. So now let's talk about the PR curve. So in this case, when we, when we compute the PR, that's precision recall curve, we are replacing the false positive rate with precision. And our precision is defined here. You see it on the screen. It is the true positive a true positive count divided by the true positives plus false positives. So in this case, we're only focusing in on how well our model is able to, to identify the positives that exist in our data set. So if we now run this cell here, we are going to compute the precision and recall so the precision recall curve, this function is just available from scikit-learn. And now we can compute the, the PR curve for our imbalanced data set. And now we see this profile here. The precision is now on the vertical axis. Remember that replaces our false positive rate. And it turns out our true positive rate is the exact same thing as recall. And we've now moved that to the horizontal axis. So the blue curve here represents our model. And like before, the more area that it occupies, so the more that this blue curve moves over to the top right-hand corner, the better the model is doing. Now the baseline in this case is indicated by this horizontal dashed orange line. And this dashed orange line just represents the positive rate in our data. In this case, it's 1%. So this is just the expected level of precision that we could expect from sampling from our data randomly. So now we can compute the area under this curve to get a sense, like before, of how well our model is doing, independent of the cutoff threshold. And now we get a value of 0.42. And this is a big difference from what we saw earlier from the ROC. 
but it gives us a more effective means of of quantifying how well our model is doing at identifying those positive cases in our imbalanced data set. So you might be asking with these two different approaches, when should we use one versus the other? Well, I have that summarized here just at the bottom of the notebook. And it turns out that for both, so we, both measures represent effective means of evaluating a classifier that's independent of the threshold choice. However, the ROC area under the curve is better suited for problems where you don't have much class imbalance and where you're primarily interested in identifying both class labels in your data set. The PR AUC is appropriate for highly imbalanced data. And here we are primarily interested in measuring how well our model is at finding those positive samples in our data. That's, that's the primary focus. We're not really interested in identifying the other class label. So the PR AUC is something that's typically used if you're working on problems such as fraud detection, email spam notification, anything where you have a highly imbalanced data set. So this concludes the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you do like this content, please like, share, and subscribe to the channel. It's always appreciated. And I will see you in the next video.